Okay, good morning. Uh, I make it a couple of minutes past eight. Uh, we seem to have a good few people in the room with us, so we're going to start this webinar on the Geodrone. So a little bit about me, just to start with, my name's Jimmy Adcock. Uh, I'm a senior applications engineer for Guideline Geo. I've been with Guideline for five years, and prior to that, I was doing geophysics survey for a company in the UK for about 13 years, um, doing various projects, uh, including archaeology, engineering and utilities. And I have a sort of mixed background. I trained as a geophysicist and primarily in guideline, I actually work on the, the ABEM products, um, which we'll talk about in a minute. Uh, but uh, I actually used GPR Slice quite a lot in my previous job uh, since somewhere in the mid 2000s. So uh, that's how I've ended up uh, being with you this morning. Uh, just a background, I think most of the people in the room probably know Guideline Geo or Abram or Marlow. Uh, in case you don't, a little bit of um, information just about the company in general. Uh, we make uh, four types of product. We make uh, ground penetrating radar, uh, time domain electromagnetic systems, uh, electrical resistivity and uh, seismic systems. And uh, we're the production head offices and all of our R&D are uh, in Sweden. And then we have offices actually across the globe. So we cover most of the time zones uh, pretty well. I'm based in uh, near Manchester, as is my colleague, Mike, who's going to be helping me with the, the presentation today. And the company has quite a long history uh, of involvement in geophysics. Uh, ABAM itself was founded in 1923. And uh, this is just a brief summary of kind of where we've introduced our main products through that time span. And so rather excitingly, we're coming up to very close to our hundredth year, which uh, we're all very much looking forward to. So let's move on to what we're going to be doing today. I'm going to be primarily talking about the uh, Geodrone. Uh, what is it? Um, how do we transport it? Uh, what is it good for? And uh, just in case there's anyone here who is actually new to GPR in general, rather than just the um, use of, of GPR with a drone system, uh, we'll do a little bit of background information on how GPR works and then how that's applied to a um, airborne platform. After that, look at how we post-process the data to actually get the interpretation from that, the, the useful bit uh, of the survey. And we're going to be using GPR Slice today to do that. Um, we could use a number of different types of software. Uh, we could use a package called ReflexW. Uh, we could actually use some of our own Marla software. Uh, but today we're going to concentrate on Slice. OK, so what is the Geodrone as a, for a start? Um, it kind of does what it says on the tin. It's, uh, it's a radar system uh, mounted on some kind of drone airborne platform, uh, primarily for surveying in areas where uh, a ground coupled system would not be feasible. So it may be that it's a um, hazardous area, or it may be something like a river, as we have in this photo here, um, where it would just be very difficult to launch um, you know, a, or undertake a regular GPR survey. Uh, you can see that this photo has come courtesy of the USGS, the United States Geological Service, and they've been a really important partner for us in the development of this uh, product and have helped us a lot along the way in terms of testing and defining what the system should be capable of. Um, in more detail about the, uh, the Geodrone, it actually works on our GX platform, so if anyone is already familiar with the GX system and the controller, it's going to be using the same controller unit. Uh, we got a 80 megahertz antenna at present, and we have a, a standard DGPS system built in. So that gives us an accuracy if we're in, uh, uh, if we have good conditions, open skies of around one to two meters, which for the kind of projects that we would be doing with the Geodrome, which we'll talk about in a moment, um, that's usually accurate enough. We have a Wi-Fi connection to transfer the data from the antenna to the console. And um, the unit itself, the, the antenna unit that's on the drone, 
has a, a can work autonomously. So should that Wi-Fi connection be lost between the console that you're holding and the, the actual antenna unit itself, it will continue to collect the data. And then once the two come back into range and connection is re-established, it will then buffer the data through uh, back to the controller. So you don't need to worry about the fact that uh, you might lose that Wi-Fi connection. The instrument will continue to record whilst, it, um, whilst it's away from the controller. And being part of the GX family, that means that we're using our HDR technology. This is our uh, high dynamic range. This is giving us a larger bandwidth, which improves uh, depth penetration and resolution on the antennas. And again, if anyone's used the GX, um, hopefully you'll know that they're very good antennas. And so being able to take that technology and put it into the drone uh, has been really useful for us. Generally, the operation time is about an hour. Um, but you'll probably find that it's the flight time of the drone that is the um, bigger problem in terms of how long you can survey for before needing to replace batteries. So a very close up of, of what the antenna looks like, uh, what the system looks like. We've got a transmit antenna in one of those tubes and receive antenna in the other. So they are separa uh, separated antennas then in a single box and then we have the the main control electronics in the center uh, we have our connections on the end panel of the unit for the various data stream and communication and the battery bay is uh, slightly different from a gx uh, we're using smaller lighter batteries uh, that we can swap very easily in the field without uh, too much trouble. Uh, the weight, which of course is always very important when you're talking about uh, a system that you want to mount onto a drone, uh, we're talking in the region of three kilos when it's got the batteries in it. So that brings me on to, well, what do you carry it with? Um, this isn't gonna be uh, a small drone that you can pick up off eBay. Uh, you know, we're talking about a, a professional large scale uh, drone as the platform for the uh, machine, for the instrument. And uh, at present, we don't offer this. Uh, we advise the customer on the best model and type of drone to, uh, to acquire, and we allow them to find one that they're comfortable with using um, rather than kind of dictate. If you would like to take advice, we can certainly give you that. Um, and the primary thing is that it can carry the weight of the system itself. So it needs to have a payload capacity of three and a half kilos or above. And really you need it to be able to fly for more than 30 minutes at a time. Otherwise you're gonna have a very stop start um, survey process. The one that we use and the one that the USGS were using as well, I believe uh, was the DGI Matrix 600. Uh, so if you can find an equivalent to that, um, that would be the best way forward. Uh, so we talked about the fact that it's quite a low frequency antenna and that uh, our GPS is not, uh, is DGPS, so it's not a precision GPS, so to speak. So that kind of controls what the suitable targets and conditions that we might be using this in are. Uh, so here you can see a, an early prototype of the system. And uh, we quite like the look of this one, but we decided that the maintenance, trying to keep this moustache going, was just too much. So we decided to go for the actual drone attachment. <laughs> so what are the conditions that we would have to use this in? Well, we have to have the same conditions that a ground coupled antenna would be used in. So non-conductive soils is the big one. If we have a very high clay content or potentially saline, um, fluid within the soils or the geology, uh, they're going to be problematic because they're very conductive. And if you're over a very conductive material, the GPR signal is attenuated very quickly, it's absorbed very quickly, and we don't get any depth penetration whatsoever. So non-conductive soils are very important. We're typically going to be talking about trying to identify layers rather than discrete objects. Um, if we are, um, in terms of that, in terms of finding, mapping our layers, uh, suitable target depth, you can see here is approximately 10 meters, but depending upon the geology, 
um, we may be able to go to 25 or more. Uh, so if it's a nice resistive material, then we will get deeper penetration than if it has more conductive material mixed within it. Uh, if you are intending to look at targets rather than broad layers, then those targets would need to be in the order of one to two meters in uh, diameter or bigger for us to be able to reliably detect them with that 80 megahertz antenna. So already this is starting to shape the applications that the system is suitable for. And again, as we say with the GPS that's on board, uh, there's a limit to um, how closely we could pinpoint a target that we have found. So typically the application areas are layers or large objects where we're not worried about centimeter accuracy in terms of the positioning. And so typically that's things like glaciology, um, bathymetry, so mapping the, the bottom of river channels or lakes, you know, uh, looking at sediment behind dams, for example, things like that where we have fresh water. Um, large sinkholes, this could be a very useful tool for that. You know, if you're concerned about the stability of the material above the sinkhole, then obviously not having to have a person push uh, a GPR antenna directly over the top of it uh, would be a very big bonus to you. And then sedimentology, you know, geological mapping of, of the layering within sediments. The final one would be um, avalanche risk, looking at the, the volume of snow that we, you might have on a slope and assessing you know, whether that is likely to start moving at all. Uh, as I said at the beginning, uh, just in case anyone is new to GPR in general, rather than just the, the drone, uh, we just put in a quick slide about how GPR operates, um, you know, the, the basic principles that we're working on. So in all GPR systems, uh, we will have a transmit antenna, which is uh, TX on this diagram and a receive antenna, which is RX. And the transmitter is going to send out a series of radio wave pulses into the ground. Now, radar is very effective at getting energy into the ground, but it also tends to uh, transmit above ground as well. So in this figure, we can see that we have some radio waves that are transmitting through the air above the ground surface and some that are in the ground. And the energy that is traveling through the air will be traveling approximately three times faster than the energy in the ground. So that means that, that as that radio wave spreads out, uh, the energy that's traveled through the air is gonna reach our receiver first, and that gives us a kick. Um, uh, you know, we receive the signal on the uh, instrument. The next thing that arrives will be the direct arrival. So that's energy that's traveled just below the surface in a straight line between the transmit and receive. And then typically after that, we're then waiting for energy to come back from reflections in the ground. And we will get a reflection from anything that uh, has an electromagnetic contrast. So any layers that have different properties um, will create some kind of reflection and the bigger the contrast between the different layers or the object and the material surrounding it the more energy that gets sent back so that reflection comes back up towards the surface and when it arrives at the receiver again we get another kick and we're recording the amplitude of that response and also the polarity of the energy so in the old days we used to use these wiggle traces um, and put them all side by side and use those to, to map the layers and the features. Uh, but now we tend to apply a color scale to it where the colors indicate the polarity and the strength of the response. So if we take that single trace, that one transmission of a radio wave then received back at the instrument, um, if we repeat that time and time again as we move forward, then we can gradually build up this nice two-dimensional picture of the ground. And uh, with the instrument, with the ground coupled instruments, as we say, we're getting lots of that energy into the ground. So we get good, strong signals back, nice, clean data. And we're gonna be using an encoder wheel on the instrument, um, which is gonna measure our distance along the survey profile. So uh, it's all very simple when we're doing ground-based surveys. 
Once we take the antenna into the air, things get slightly more tricky. Uh, we have a big air gap, which means that it's going to be difficult for us to get as much energy into the ground, and therefore the signals coming back are going to be smaller. The data quality will be reduced somewhat. And uh, because we can't use any kind of encoder wheel, then we're going to be relying upon time triggering, uh, just allowing the instrument to run all of the time, and then a GPS for our position. Our product manager went to town with this animation, so <laughs> this is very nice. Um, when we have our antennas in the air, the energy is going to be extending out in all directions. So again, we are reducing the amount of energy that we can get into the ground. And if we were flying that uh, antenna very high up, uh, the amount of energy that we can transfer to the subsurface is going to be small. And if it's small going in, it's going to be even smaller when it comes back out. Not only that, if we're high up, we're also going to be getting reflections from our product manager's favorite vehicles. <laughs> and also trees and other objects that are close to the antennas above the ground. So this is going to be a problem because they will appear as if they are features below the surface. It will be very difficult to differentiate them. So in the ideal world, what we really want to do is we want to have that antenna nice and close to the ground and preferably that is within one meter. And it's not just preferable, it's actually set out in some of the legislation that is, exists in Europe and North America at the moment, any GPR antenna is restricted to operating within one meter above the, the ground surface. So apart from the legislation, we would want to do that anyway, because if we can do that, we get the best quality data back from the system. So <clears throat> just looking at how it would look if we were actually collecting data on the instrument itself, uh, in our either very wet or dangerous or possibly both uh, environment. We would have our GX controller. We would switch on our geodrone antenna and our controller, and the two would initialize and automatically begin to communicate. So the system would make the pairing between the antenna and the console. It would detect that it's a geodrone. Uh, antenna that is attached and it would therefore offer us the geodrome project on the controller itself. So this is just a standard GX controller, nothing different from if you've already seen one or used one, uh, there's nothing different in terms of how that's going to operate. Uh, we've got the quality of the GPS signal so we can make sure that we are actually tracking where our antenna goes and then we've got the battery meters to tell us um, the level of power in the console itself and also the geodrone antenna uh, underneath our aerial platform. So we would bring our instrument to site, we would take off, fly across the site, and in real time we should be able to get the data in. As I say, if the Wi-Fi connection would drop out, then the antenna itself will continue to record and allow us to, uh, to buffer that data back into the console when the connection is re-established. From that, of course, we can then start to make our interpretation. And in this kind of example, we would be looking at uh, this being the top of the sediment at the bottom of this marsh area. And then this is the wet water column above. And this is kind of how the um, example data set we're gonna look at in a minute um, this is what we'll see with that one as well. Uh, typically, we would recommend not trying to fly the uh, survey manually. Um, it's very, very difficult to fly steady at low altitude, and it does require a very experienced drone pilot. Um, if for no other reason than forget about data quality, um, just think about the cost of the drone that you have and also the uh, the GPR electronics that you have slung beneath it. You really don't want to uh, have an accident with that. So typically using the navigation software is recommended. Um, and most of the, the drone manufacturers, manufacturers will have some kind of offering for being able to program your survey 
path in and then allow the drone to to follow that um, it just ensures that we get good coverage and also helps us to keep that uh, altitude correct the geo drone is actually uh, an interesting product in terms of the warranties that we offer it's the, because it's the first product that we've offered an extended warranty with a kind of no questions asked replacement of the system um, we recognize that if you are slinging something underneath a, a drone, there is the room for something to go wrong. And because of that, we are offering this extended warranty um, at an additional cost. And basically, if you were to crash the system um, and the antenna was to be broken beyond um, uh, repair, it wouldn't work. If you were to send it back to us, uh, we would send you back a working system um, as a replacement. So we're trying to uh, trying to ensure that uh, you have that that backup in place should the worst happen. OK, so that's. Um, that's a, the, a very quick background about the geo drone itself. Uh, of course, if you have any questions about the, the kind of sales or the availability of the system in your region, um, please don't hesitate to uh, contact us. Uh, if you just use the studio.com email address, or you could go to the website and put an inquiry into there, um, we will get back to you very quickly and uh, give you more information on the system uh, and costs as well. Uh, unfortunately, I'm a technical man, so uh, I'm probably not the best person to answer those, but we have a, lot, a very good big sales team that will be more than happy to uh, help you out with that so please get in touch and um, we can discuss the kind of projects that you might be thinking of using this for and uh, you know make sure that we can supply you the very best package okay All right so that's the that's the system uh, we're going to have a, a quick look at a, a, a real data example so this was some data that was collected um, near our r d office in northern sweden uh, in near umeo and uh, this was part of our, our development process. So this was the data from one of our prototype systems. And uh, you can see that we've got, this is raw data from the instrument. So you can see that we've got the base of our river. And what the uh, user was doing with the antenna was they were going back and forth across a river channel. And so you've got the base of the river then coming up the fairly steep sided riverbank turning around and going back into the river channel, cross the river to the other bank, then turning around and coming back again. So that's why we've got this kind of cyclical uh, nature to the response. And here we can see the uh, path that they took. So this is actually a slightly unusual data set in that it is just a single very long profile. Um, and there are kind of two schools of thought about how you would go about doing a survey, uh, whether you want to separate it into a series of, of separate traverses and process them all separately, or actually just program in, as we've talked about, one big route and then collect that data uh, in one go. So uh, this example, single data file, I think it's something like two and a half kilometers long, um, and uh, we're going to process it all as one. As I say, we're going to use GPR Slice. Uh, this uh, is a, a piece of software that's been around since uh, the first half of the 2000s commercially, I think I'm right in saying. Um, I've been using it uh, since probably 2005. And uh, the software has developed over time into a, a very comprehensive um, package of uh, GPR processing for GPR processing. A uh, guideline has been an official distributor since last year, uh, possibly the end of 2018. And uh, so we can provide subscriptions for the software and we can also supply support and training uh, on those packages that we sell. Uh, GPR Slice is very interesting in that it is not tied to any one specific manufacturer. Uh, as far as I'm aware, any uh, GPR system that is currently on the open market, uh, GPR Slice can be used to process their data. Uh, in terms of Marla uh, specifically, 
uh, it is set up to actually just process the individual files that come from any of our systems. So the .rd3s, the .rd7s, just standalone profiles. Uh, but it can also import 3D grid projects. So if anyone has used uh, any of the systems and you know of the, the 3D grid projects, which we use a lot on the CX system, the concrete um, system, but also some of the, like the Easy Locator, uh, it can import those directly. Uh, we can import mirror data, that's our multi-channel high resolution system, uh, both the existing model and also the brand new HDR system, which has just been released, and also our object mapper format, which is a way of being able to define a survey grid very simply and tie all of your profiles together um, whilst you're in the field. Uh, GPR Slice can automatically read those, those files in. So that's input. In terms of output, there's very little it can't do. Um, it can allow us to deal with um, 2D data, just generating profiles, either topo corrected or um, just flat profiles. Uh, we can put a series of profiles together to create a 3D volume. Uh, we can slice that volume horizontally, creating what we call time slices. And that was what the software was originally intended to do. Uh, we can do ISO surfaces. So that's where we take the quiet zones where we don't have any reflections. We actually remove that from the volume and just leave the regions where we have the strongest responses. Uh, we can do horizon mapping, and that's what we're going to look at with uh, this data example, uh, where we're just picking out layers from a series of profiles. Uh, vector positioning. So rather than just defining the position of the antenna in X, Y, and Z, which is kind of traditional, uh, we can also then define which direction the antenna is pointing in. So we can do very complex survey shapes uh, and be able to compile um, a volume of data regardless of what the shape of that object is. And also we can do other analysis of data such as looking at how frequency might vary. So frequency varies depending upon the absorption of the, the radio waves and that can actually tell us something about the structure of the ground. So massive amount of uh, capability within this software. Um, as I said, the vector um, vector positioning of antennas, um, again, allows us this uh, ability to, to work in more than just flat planes. Um, and the software also has what it's called blue box processing. So when I run through the, the, the steps of processing this geodrome data, we're going to kind of do it manually. So I'm going to do each of the steps in turn and you'll be able to see how it's done. Uh, but the software allows you to actually just kind of batch process. So you just set the software up to run. You tell it what kind of survey you're doing, uh, what kind of survey you've done. Um, and it will go through and it will do each of the processing steps in turn without you having to actually input too much information yourself, uh, which can really speed up the processing time. So uh, it's, it's referred to as blue box uh, because black box processes are processes where something goes in at one end you don't know what happens in the middle and then your result comes out the other so with this one we stop at certain points during the process and just check on our data so uh, it's not quite as uh, the, the method isn't quite as hidden as it would be in a black box process so um, the gpr slice developers have, have called it blue box so gpr slice itself um the the kind of workflow that you would use doesn't really change regardless of how the data have been collected and um or, or what kind of data you want to output at the end what kind of visualization you want to have uh, typically you just stop at different places if you want just radiograms or time slices so i've got a few slides just to show the kind of general process that we would go through and then um, I'll actually do some real-time processing of the geodrome data. So typically with GPR Slice, the first thing we do is we, we set up a project area. And when we're setting up the project area, we choose the type of instrument that we'll be using. And that allows the software to actually um, give us the correct options for the data we're going to be putting into it. So we then copy the data in, in the format that it comes off the instrument. 
We then um, do a bit of editing of the positioning. So it might be that we had gridded data and we just want to define where each profile was in a grid, or we want to just clean up our GPS uh, data stream. So we'll do that. We then convert the data from the native Marlow format into GPR slice format, put some positional stamps in. So most GPR data uh, will have a file with the data in it and a file with the positioning information in. And to make everything simpler, GPR slice says, well, I'm going to take that information, I'm going to embed it into the GPR data itself. So we only have one file per profile. So that's very useful. Uh, we then do our processing, our filtering, our gains to allow us to be able to see um, the, 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 all of the reflections in our profiles, correct uh, for any geometric effects, so like a migration, or do background filtering, um, frequency filtering, whatever we need to do. Point. We can actually just, we have our first kind of chance to export data. So we can export radar grams at that point. Um, we can do our horizon mapping so we can go through and digitize where surfaces are within the data. And if it was mirror data, if it was multi-channel 3D data where we have very high density data in line and cross line, we can actually then create a volume at that point. We don't need to do any more processing. We can actually just create a 3D block of data, which we can then start to slice or do our ISO surfaces. Um, whatever it is that we want to do. Going on from that stage, uh, we can actually then start to generate these time slices. So if we have coarsely spaced profiles, say every half meter, every one meter, uh, this is how we would then go about um, generating the time slices. So um, what GPR slice does is it actually takes our very densely sampled radar grams and counterintuitively it desamples them it actually reduces the number of data points there are along the line and this is what was unique about gpr slice when it came out it took this approach of saying well we have way more data along our profile than we do between our profiles and that's actually causing a lot of distortion if you look at very early time slices from different packages you get this kind of weird striation in the data and it made it very difficult to do an interpretation on it. Uh, so GPR slice said, we're gonna desample uh, before we try and generate the slices. And actually what it gives you is a better, cleaner um, slice, which is far easier to work with and actually ends up giving you better uh, detail of the subsurface structures. So we desample it, we generate coarse slices with just um, sparse intervals, and then we would interpolate that to actually generate the final images. So it was a slightly novel approach, um, but uh, one that worked. So at that stage then, we can export our 2D time slices. Um, we can um, digitize, we can do interpretations on these uh, at that stage. Next stage would be to take all of those slices, put them into a, a block, into a cube, uh, and generate our 3D volume. And then at that point, we have the complete range of visualization available to us. So we can post process that volume, clean it up if we need to, uh, enhance certain types of features, and then do all of our export. So that is the general workflow. That would be what you did on every survey, uh, every time. And it's just where you would stop, depending upon whether you're happy with just 2D radar gram analysis, um, 2D time slices, or you want a full 3D volume. Okay, so let's look at our uh, data. So what I've done so far is I have just set up my uh, project already just before the webinar started. So I have created um, a, a Marla GX project uh, and I've called it uh, Geodrone Webinar and hit new survey and then that's generated the, the kind of all of the folders that I need to work in. And then I've just copied my raw data into the uh, the folder that it's generated on my PC so that uh, I have the line there ready for me to start processing. So if I now close down my uh, presentation, let's get rid of that. 
This is uh, GPR slice. Uh, let's just check. Yep, you can see that on the screen there. And as I say, I have created my new project and I have transferred my data and I've created a basic information file. So basic information file is just telling the software uh, how many profiles do I have and what is their name. And now I'm going to edit that. So in here we can see that I have um, the information file. And I've, as I said before, I've just got a single uh, radar line, just one big long profile. And all I'm going to do is I'm going to ask the software to read the header file from this data and to get the time window and also get the uh, number of samples in each trace. So it will read that in automatically. And then the next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to ask it to extract from the positional file uh, the track data. So you can see here that it's now added in the number of tags, GPS tags that are in my data set. So if I save those edits, I can now look at my GPS track. So here is my line and there's a green dot to show where I started and there's a red dot to show where it finished. So you can see it's just basically gone round and round and round and then come back pretty close to the start. And we can see that the total length of this survey line is 2,600 meters. So 2.6 kilometers of data and I'm going to process this all in one go. So uh, I'm afraid my laptop is a bit of a uh, slow coach, a bit of an old dog. So there will be a little bit of pause between some of the processing steps whilst it does this entire line. But you'll see that it doesn't really take that long. Uh, when we're in here, we can actually export this track to uh, DXF. So you could then import that into uh, an AutoCAD style package or into a GIS package so that you'd be able to drop this directly onto the map. Uh, we can also export it to a KMZ format, uh, which is Google Earth. So if I was to open my project area, track, I've uh, got KML and KMZ, so open that up. And hopefully Google Earth will then fly me to northern Sweden. So there's my uh, file that I've opened. And there's my survey lines. Uh, we also then, the rest of the buttons in here primarily are to do with filtering and editing this track. So this is relatively good um, GPS data. We haven't had any bad uh, data points. We haven't had the signal drop out or the, the accuracy suddenly drop. But if you were looking at the track and there was uh, a GPS point that suddenly jumped out to one side, uh, we can either manually delete them, manually move them. We can automatically filter the track so it follows the line of the track and it looks at every data point and it works out whether if a data point has suddenly jumped to one side, um, it knows that that is unlikely to be a real data point and it will either just remove it or pull it back in line with the rest of them. Uh, we can also um, add in offsets. So if we were using a system where the GPS wasn't actually coincident with the antenna, uh, we could add in here offsets to correct for that as well. So when I created um, this track, I got an error message that came up to tell me that there were some data points that had more than one GPS stamp associated with them. And that'll probably be near the start of the profile when the antenna wasn't actually moving anywhere. So just delete those. I've basically just done what the software told me to do. I can now exit here and I can convert my data into the uh, Marla for, uh, into the GPR slice format from the original Marla format. So here's um, a section of my data and I get to see the pulse on the left. And then if I apply any kind of filtering at this very early stage, I can see the result of that on the right hand side. But I'm not going to apply any gains or any filtering. I'm just going to do a conversion um, without 
uh, altering the data in any way. So I'll do my filtering afterwards. So as I say, it uh, takes a little while for me to run through this just because it's two and a half kilometers of data. And also quite a long time window as well. So if you think in terms of how many data points we actually have in this data set, it's um, probably quite a terrifying number. When we're flying um, drone data as well, and in fact, with a lot of GPR data, we actually have a, a gap between the very top of our data file, the top of each trace, and where the first arrival is, the, what we call time zero, so the, the ground surface. And what we're going to do is we're going to try and get rid of that. And so that's why I haven't done any filtering yet. So next thing, now I've made it into the GPR slice format. I just put these navigational markers in so that we don't have to have separate files. All of our navigation will just be contained within the profile itself. And so it will just run through and uh, put the tags in for us. And then I can go to my radar gram editing and now correct for that time zero. So get rid of the dead data that is basically between the antenna firing, uh, the radio waves traveling down and then getting to the ground surface or the, in this case, the water surface and then coming back up again. And this is an automated process. So I choose whether I want it to cut the same amount off along the entire profile or whether I want it to look at each individual trace. And for airborne data, I want it to look at every trace because I can't be sure that the antenna was at the same elevation all the time. So I want to correct for that. So I'm going to say scan by scan. And I can switch the multi-thread processing off. So it will search through that profile from start to finish, look at every trace and just look at where the first reflection comes in. And it's telling me that there is a range, basically just one sample different all the way along that profile. Okay. And it will then begin the process of correcting it and what it's doing is it's taking the data from this radar folder and it's going to apply the correction and then put it into the edit folder so gpr slice never overwrites your raw data each of the processing steps uh, puts the data into a separate folder uh, so it's very easy to take a step back and try again if you think that you've made a mistake in terms of the settings that you've used okay so it's just confirming that i have done that so close that window uh, down. And now I'm ready to actually filter the data. And with GX data, if you're using it ground coupled, there's actually very little filtering you need to do. It's very clean data. Um, all I would normally do is maybe apply some gain uh, and occasionally some kind of background removal. Um, once you, again, take that antenna off the ground, you do tend to get more noise. So if I choose where I want to take my data from, which of those multiple folders. If I hit this spectra and gain button, what we can see in here is very similar to the conversion menu that we looked at just a minute ago, uh, where I have um, a sample of the data. I have my raw trace, and then I'm going to have my process trace on the right hand side. And in here, I can do two things at once. I can apply a gain, so turn the volume up on the responses that are deeper in the traces. Uh, and I can also filter out frequencies that I am not interested in. So typically, you know, communication noise, um, instrument noise that are at the top and end of the um, frequency range that are basically just causing artifacts in the data. Uh, so if I just hit auto gain, what you can see is that we actually have a lot of horizontal banding in here, and that's called ringing, and that is very, very common um, as soon as you lift an antenna off the ground. Reason being, you get this strong reflection from the ground surface. It then reverberates between the ground surface and the antenna itself, and you get this uh, very marked banding in there. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to just come out of here and I'm going to apply a background filter. And this is going to look at the entire radargram and anything that is consistent all the way through and therefore unlikely to be a real feature, it's going to um, reduce the effect of that for me. 
And so you can see here, it goes through scan by scan processing the file. And at the moment, what I'm doing is I'm allowing this to, to kind of process with just a single core on my laptop. And uh, that means it's a little bit slower, but it gives you that progress screen. So you can actually start to see what's happening. And the software has a uh, multi-thread processing uh, as an option. And if you do that, then it will use more cores within your uh, computer's processor and actually speed up the, the processing steps by a considerable margin, sort of five to seven times quicker. OK, uh, so I've filtered the data, so I'm going to use this filter folder, go back into this Spectra and Gain menu. And we should be able to see if I scroll forward now, this is much, much cleaner. And so that's going to make it much easier for us to be able to pick uh, where the uh, the river um, bed is. And so these AGCs, it basically just tries to um, average out the, the response strength throughout the uh, trace. It's not always the, the best way to apply a gain to uh, GPR data. Um, and quite often, I might just define my own gain curve. But for a demo like this, it's quite a handy, fast way to be able to do it. Uh, just looking at the, the band pass filtering, just to show you how that works, the, that's the low limit. So anything below that is basically being cut out. Any frequencies below that green line are going to be removed. And any frequencies above this green line get removed. So if, for example, I was to put my thresholds right down here, and say help set. Now you can see that it's only keeping the low frequency component of uh, my data. If I did the opposite and put it right up here and said help set, then I'm only seeing the high frequency. So this is an 80 megahertz antenna. So I want to um, have a range somewhere in the kind of 40 to to higher sort of region, and anything else I'll uh, I'll remove. So I'm going to leave it like that for now. Close this and run the processing. And I've switched on the processing graphics now. So what we'll see uh, when this is completed, hopefully, is uh, a before and after shot of what the data looked like when it went into the process and what the data looked like when it came out of the process. And that's a really useful tool, um, especially if uh, it's quite a complex data set that you've got, or you are not entirely um, kind of familiar with how some of the filters work. It means you can directly compare the, uh, the before and after effects and work out whether that filter has done what you need it to do. So just let this finish. All of the filters in here are kind of the typical filters that you would have in a, most GPR processing packages. So the name should be uh, relatively familiar if you've done any processing before. And there. Again, the downside of using uh, a profile that is two and a half kilometers long and having a slightly slow computer. <laughs> okay, so that is our before. And that is our after. Um, they're actually squeezed on the screen a fair bit. So if you imagine that's two and a half kilometers compressed into quite a small space. But we can see that we've got the, the riverbed there relatively clearly. So I'm happy with that. I'm now going to go in and do my uh, picking of the horizons. So just say that I want to uh, detect or draw a horizon. So I can see my full profile here, and you can see the, the riverbed as we go back and forth across it, uh, kind of dipping up and down. And the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to pick horizon number one, which needs to be the top surface. So I need to define the top of the first layer. So I'm just going to say that it's on the first real sample, and I'm going to hit auto detect. And that will go again, go through every trace and hopefully input my uh, my first line, my the top of my first layer. So there we go, that black line, that's uh, layer number one. 
So just save that. Now I'm ready to do layer number two, and this is where it should get more interesting. So now I want to try and pick my river channel. So I'm not going to make it look at the entire data set. Uh, I can scroll my mouse around in here and it tells me where the mouse is in terms of samples and position. So I can see that the riverbed um, doesn't extend beyond kind of 620 um, samples. So I'll tell it to search for a layer uh, within that range. And I'm going to put a bit of filtering on so it doesn't put a marker on every trace. It averages over a certain number of traces. And then I'm going to tell it to auto detect. And so this time you should hopefully see a blue line appear in here. And that blue line should near enough be the, uh, the riverbed. OK, so there we go. So I'm just going to click on save. And what we can do is, I mean, obviously at this scale, it's very difficult to tell whether that's a good or a bad fit. We can see it's roughly right. So I can say OK. I can actually zoom in to one section of this. So let's say uh, there we go. So now I can see a chunk of my uh, profile. I've got a big static area here, which is when the measurement started. And then what I can do is I can hit edit. And then I can just simply click on anywhere on the, uh, the profile to map, uh, remap where I think that horizon should be in terms of the reflections. And uh, again, this is something where you can put a filter length on it so that you actually define a longer section as you click, which would then speed up the process of correcting anything where the automatic picking hasn't quite got it spot on. And basically, I would just do that all the way through my line just to make sure that I am really hitting the, uh, the layer that I want, uh, that I haven't missed anything. Or sometimes it will pick something higher in the section. Um, in a river, you might have uh, fishing floats. Uh, you might have big fish. Uh, which, believe it or not, will give you quite a strong reflection. And so sometimes it will try and pick that. So you just need to just double check that uh, there's nothing you need to correct. Uh, we draw. Once you're happy with how the thing looks, you can save that layer. We can then exit. And we can compile our horizon. So what we're doing now is, we're taking all of those depth positions all the way along the radar gram, and the radar gram snakes backwards and forwards, backwards and forwards. And we can uh, compile the horizons into a plan of depth against uh, GPS coordinate. And so we can do that for as many horizons as we like. So we could have the top of the silt. We might then have a horizon that is um, solid bedrock. And each one of those would have a separate file associated with it. Okay. And then I can tell it to grid my horizon. So we've got that course file. And I just want to make it a little bit smoother. So I say help set. And I'll interpolate between those data points that I've digitized on my radar gram to generate, hopefully, a nice, smooth uh, data set. Right. Once that's done, we're actually good to go and look at the data. So I hit the Open GL button. I've compiled those horizons and I have gridded them. Um, I just choose my the horizon that I'm interested in. So number two was the riverbed, number one was the top surface, and uh, pick that horizon. So that is across our site, that's our uh, riverbed. 
And what we can do then is we can actually put that into context. So at the moment, we can see that we've got the lighter colors where the, the river channel is nearer the surface and the darker channels where it's deeper. And as with the data I was working on, I didn't actually go through and check the auto digitization. So we've got some strange peaks in here that we would normally have filtered out ourselves. But uh, you kind of get the impression of, of how that's working. So as I say, we can now put this into context. So we can uh, choose to a bitmap image. And we can uh, get an image from Google Earth. So it'll automatically zoom into the region of the Earth where our data were collected from. And we just hit store map. And then when we close this down, uh, we then have our Google map there. And I can then drop my horizon in either above it, um, which is one way to do it. Or alternatively, if I just clear that down, uh, I can show my map and I can change the transparency on that. So I can set that. That's that it's relatively transparent. I can then put in my horizon again. Uh, make my horizon less transparent. And then at the moment, I'm still on top of the image. So uh, all I would need to do is come into uh, my bitmap image, uh, just change the depth from this. 0 0.5. This is where it's going to position that uh, Google Earth image. So now it's putting that at the top. And so now we have the, the surface um, extending beneath. And so we can see the riverbank coming up to where um, the survey was started. Uh, and then the survey would have been tracking across to the other riverbank and back. And if I was to store that, I could put my radar tracks on there. So we can see how that relates to each other. Uh, from here, we've got choices in here. We can um, export these as images. So any particular viewpoint that we like, uh, we can export as an image from up here. We can actually make animations um, automatically. So we can choose um, a certain uh, Kind of viewing angle and a, get it to, to do a, an animation of a trajectory so it would record uh, from a, a series of different positions around that data set and then create an avi you know a video file from that to give us a more dynamic view uh, we can view this uh, we don't have to view this in 3d we can actually view this in 2d as well uh, so we can just look at a, a simple top down view. And again, we can export these as images, uh, either just sort of standalone images or geo referenced. Uh, we can also then take this uh, this topography data, this horizon data. Um, and from our gridding menus, uh, we can actually export those to a series of different formats. So, for example, um, Surfer, Geosoft, MeshLab or just a basic X, Y, Z uh, file. So that would be uh, GPS positions and depth to the top of that surface. And you could then drop that into a package of your choice, whatever it might be, uh, to use that data streams. Uh, with our um, import of the, of the images, we're not confined to, uh, importing just the, uh, the the Google Earth images. Um, if we choose that bitmap option again, uh, we could actually import any file we want. So we just browse to the location on our PC, um, say what the, the file name is. And then if we give the image coordinates for the four corners of the image, um, it will drop it in here. So again, if you were to have, say, for example, a navigational map of that river that showed where perhaps there are sandbanks, um, what the channel depth is, we could actually drop that on top of our data and we could compare directly that real world GPR data with the uh, um, the real world GPR data with that recorded 
map from uh, previous. So uh, it allows us to combine data streams. So whenever you create a horizon, this text file is also created. So this is the horizon file, text file for horizon two. And for every click you make on that uh, profile or, or every automated point that goes in there, you will have uh, an X and Y location. So that is the GPS coordinates of that point. Uh, you have the distance along the profile from the start of the, uh, the, the data. You then have the number of samples down the trace and also the number of samples uh, minus where the first arrival is. So in mine, I've cut pretty much everything off the top. So there are just three samples between when the trace started and where that first arrival at time zero comes in. So you can see that the horizon is at 50, sample number 53, um, which is 50 samples from that first kick. It then tells me how deep that is in terms of time. So it's 38 or nearly 39 nanoseconds down the trace, and then the equivalent depth from the top of the trace. So it's um, 0 0.78 meters from the surface. Uh, then I've got a depth and an elevation. So elevation uh, depth would be uh, looking at the um, the difference uh, from our from the surface, and then elevation is the real world position. And so here we were measuring on a river. The river is at sea level at this point, so our depth and our elevation are the same numbers. Just one is the negative of the other. And then it tells us which scan number in the profile and which profile it has come from. So that is effectively everything that that surface is built from. So you could easily export this uh, and import it into another package using either the depth or the elevation and your XY coordinates. So very simple to, uh, to combine with other data sets then. Okay. That was a very quick run through. Uh, as I say, GPR Slice is in a massive uh, processing package, very, very powerful. You could spend probably a, an entire day doing a webinar just on that. So, uh, but hopefully that's kind of given you a flavor uh, of the software itself. And uh, with that, I'll say thank you very much for.